So I'm so delighted to be here and thank you, Anjan and Preet and everyone else for organizing this wonderful meeting and bringing us all together. Uh, I also it feel really, uh, it's really special for me to be back in New Zealand for this meeting. I actually did a master's degree at Otago uh, a number of years ago now, and it kind of set me on the path to molecular ecology. I uh, worked on conservation genetics of these lovely native species. Uh, and I want to really acknowledge Ian Jameson, whose lab I was in, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, uh, far too early. But my experience in his lab really um, led me to appreciate how cool it is to use genetic tools in ecological contexts, and also how much better the parties that ecologists have than anybody else. And so uh, <laughs> I went back to the States and did not, in fact, apply to med schools as I planned. I uh, went on in molecular ecology and moved into the ocean. So uh, thank you to New Zealand and to Ian for that. Uh, I think it has been a lot more fun with better parties than otherwise. <laughs> uh, and really, I realized my talk title was kind of a tremendously long. It probably should have been this, as this is what I plan to talk about today, is dispersal, invasion, and adaptation, and how those things interact through a marine lens, which since coming to an oceanographic institution is sort of the lens through which I now view everything. Uh, and of course, whoop, let me go back for a moment. Uh, of course, dispersal is a really important component, right, of the invasion process. You can't invade a place if you can't get there, uh, and then you can't spread and become a big problem if you can't uh, disperse from where you're originally introduced. And marine species, a number of really prominent marine invaders are things that you may not think of as really dispersing all that far as adults. You've got shore crabs living under rocks, and then you have things like mussels and barnacles, which, you know, once they're uh, settled down as adults, they're not going anywhere at all. However, uh, since I know this isn't a fully marine audience, uh, I wanted to mention that these guys have really uh, interesting life histories. And so the very beginnings of their lives, they're in the zooplankton. So have these larvae that can go really long distances. Um, they can be in the plankton for days, weeks, or, month, or even months, and that can bring them hundreds of kilometers up the coast. So that's a big advantage, both in initially getting to a new place. Uh, you're just hanging out with your zooplankton buddies and a ship sucks up some ballast water, goes across the sea, dumps you somewhere new, but it's also a big advantage when you get to a new place in allowing you to exploit current patterns and other uh, methods of dispersing up and down the coast and spreading around once you get there. And of course, dispersal also plays an important role in adaptation and how the mechanisms that species can use to adapt. I just wanna set this up with a little toy example with a heterogeneous environment. We have a blue and a yellow selective environment, and then four different sites that are suitable for our, our model circle species, each uh, indicated by an outline color. And so if you don't have particularly high dispersal, you might see something like this, where your larvae or your offspring, um, if you're uh, more of a terrestrial person, think of um, larvae as seeds with behavior. Uh, mostly settle close to their natal environment. So probably in the same environment that their parents uh, were born in. If selection comes through, then you can see that it occurs at a pretty local level, right? So the, um, the surviving offspring that are gonna produce the next generation, uh, by and large came from that same site. And so maybe the alleles underlying uh, yellow in one of these sites may be different than the other site. But that totally changes. We're going to reset this. If you have a really high dispersal, like you do in many of these marine invaders, now there's just sort of a shotgun of larvae across this environment. And there's no real uh, relationship between where you came from and where you land, uh, both in terms of the specific site and in terms of the selective environment. And so in this case, selection really occurs across this larger metapopulation. Uh, and rather than kind of a classic local adaptation scenario, like uh, you have when you have uh, shorter dispersal distances, as I showed before, this tends to promote uh, the evolution of balanced polymorphism. So maintaining genetic variation in this larger metapopulation that then kind of gets scattered across the landscape. So there's a smorgasbord of diversity for selection to choose from at each site and each generation it comes through and creates that yellow on yellow and blue on blue uh, pattern. This has been put with marine species in a really nice context by a review by Eric Sanford and Morgan Kelly as relating the scale of dispersal, so how far you go 
to the scale of the selective environment. How fast does your environment change? With kind of classic local adaptation being up in that uh, top left corner where you're very likely to land in an environment very close to that of your parents. Uh, and so you know, beneficial mutations can kind of slowly accumulate over time. Uh, and balanced polymorphism over on the bottom right where there's very little relationship between where you land and where you start. And so the um, prediction is that variation should be maintained in this population uh, at a, as a whole, and then you scatter across the landscape. Uh, and I want to point out that this isn't necessarily a really, it doesn't have to be a large selective gradient that we're thinking about geographically. So barnacles that you see down in that bottom right corner, uh, they have some really interesting balanced polymorphisms maintained at at least two really important metabolic loci. And the scale of selection there is, do you land on the top or the bottom of a rock? It can be the same rock, but your selective environment is extremely different uh, based on how exposed you are uh, to the air um, and versus how immersed you are. But I'm going to talk about green crabs. They fall about here in relation to temperature, uh, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And so these are one of the world's worst 100 invasive species. They are one of the ones without a genome, even a bad one. Uh, so they're quite a non-model species, uh, but they are very successful. And they have this classic high dispersal marine life history where they're in the plankton for one to two months as larvae. And we know they can go hundreds of kilometers or more in that time. They have been extremely successful. Their native range ranges Iceland to Morocco, so it's a pretty uh, extensive selective environment. Uh, and they've been successfully been introduced to every other continent except Antarctica. And in several of those places, they've spread pretty far across uh, these latitudinal thermal gradients. And I'm gonna tell you mostly about green crabs on the west coast of North America, but to do that, I need to give you a brief introduction to green crabs in North America proper. So the first introduction, the first introduced population of green crabs uh, that was successful was over 200 years ago, and that was to the Northeast US from a source in uh, South Central Europe, we know from some earlier genetic work of Joe Romans. That population has done quite well, and then many years later, uh, it was introduced serially to the West Coast, to San Francisco Bay, uh, first discovered in 1989. Uh, and it's passed through two bottlenecks, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Uh, just quickly, if anyone is a green crab person or knows about them, I want to acknowledge that the situation on the East Coast is a little more complicated. There is actually an expansion into Canada and Newfoundland, particularly, in conjunction with a second introduction of uh, crabs from a genetically distinct Northern European source. That's a really interesting adaptive story, but not the one that I'm telling today. Uh, but I do want to mention for anyone who's aware of that, there's absolutely no indication in a huge amount of sequencing that any of that variation made it to the West Coast. So the West Coast is a very simple uh, serial introduction native to invasive one, invasive one to invasive two, essentially. Uh, and this is some genetic diversity data from transcriptome derived SNPs. And you can see that the native range in Europe is the highest diversity. You have big loss when you drop down to the East Coast and another loss when you drop to the West Coast. And that California population looks like it may have even had another bottleneck. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. And green crabs have been wildly successful on the West Coast. They started in 1989, and I'm just going to show you a little map of their progress up the coast. Things really heated up in 1997, 98. There was a major El Nino Southern Oscillation event, and that kind of produced a beautiful uh, nearshore conveyor belt that just shot larvae up the coast all the way to Vancouver Island. So that's Central California to uh, Canada in under 10 years with the right marine conditions. Uh, in 2012, we found a, the first introduction was found in the Salish Sea, which is those. Uh, this I might need to point for those inland waters here in between Vancouver Island and mainland British Columbia and Washington State. That's a really important area for aquaculture, fisheries, and also a lot of Coast Salish tribes and First Nations have uh, tribal lands there. So there's also a particularly um, a cultural importance of a lot of those waters. Uh, that particular introduction was believed to be an accidental human mediated introduction. All the rest of these are, we're pretty sure, uh, just strictly current mediated. 2017, they spread further in the Salish Sea. And really over the past five years, green crabs have just been going wild on the West Coast. Um, they made it up to Haida Gwaii, 
in 2020, and then as of July of this year, up to Metlakatla, Alaska. So if you're keeping track, that is almost 20 degrees of latitudinal spread in under 35 years from a uh, serially bottlenecked population. So uh, I really appreciated uh, Lee's introduction, and we've, we've definitely poked a lot of holes, I think, in the genetic paradox of introduction, but I think this green crab introduction is a kind of a classic example of what we think about as a genetic paradox. So, so something I'm really interested in, I wanna tell you first about some work that I did a little while ago. And we were looking up and down the West Coast at green crab populations. And essentially the first question here is just, is there any evidence for any kind of adaptive change genetically uh, after only 30 years in this bottleneck population, really any differentiation at all? So we have these six sites. We looked at 12 uh, crabs per each site. In a few cases, I had multiple years to look at. Um, I had an, an older study, I'm going to show you a little bit of data from, uh, from early, from later, rather, uh, that had two of these sites in 2011. So um, in, we can look across crab generations by check how temporal stability by comparing to those data. Uh, and I used transcriptome-derived SNPs from the cardiac transcriptome. That's for a couple reasons. Uh, crustaceans have complete dumpster fire genomes, especially uh, crabs. There's almost no chromosome scale assemblies for any decapod crustacean. Uh, the first came out in 2020, which was uh, after I did the study, and it wasn't my species anyway. So we need to use something reduced representation, and I'm very interested uh, in function and wanted to match that earlier study. So transcriptome sequencing is much more appealing to me and pulling SNPs out of the transcriptome where I can get a sense of what they might be doing there. Um, we started with a panel of over 9,000 uh, high quality, high coverage SNPs. Uh, and then I just did some simple pruning for linkage disequilibrium to make sure that they're relatively independent and removed all but one SNP in each little LD cluster. And so what did we find? Well, the first thing we found is that one of these sites is really distinct and the rest uh, are pretty intermingled. That's uh, more or less what we expect, that big uh, kind of clump, clump cloud of sites there along the coast. Because as we said, we do know that these species disperses uh, really extensively up and down the coast. We know that both from um, all kinds of work on their larvae and just looking at that pattern of spread. So they move quite fast, they disperse quite far. But what's interesting is that one gray population, cedar drift lagoon, which is right in the middle of the old part of the range, shows some pretty distinct uh, genetic differentiation. We put the temporal data on there that's stable over time, over multiple crab generations. And there's no evidence at that site of any kind of second introduction or any shenanigans like that. Instead, it's just lost genetic diversity relative to everything else. And this was that California population I showed you earlier that looked like it had that extra bottleneck. Uh, and other than that, there is no diversity loss, even at the range edges in this study that we, uh, that we can see. And so just quickly, I don't want to dwell on sea drift, but why might that be? Sea drift lagoon is weird. It is an artificial lagoon. Everybody studies green crabs there because the middle was scooped out of a sandbar uh, in the 1970s to make more waterfront property in a private housing development. It instantly filled up with, well, not instantly, in the 90s, it filled up with green crabs and um, invasive fouling species and pretty much nothing else. And water inflow and outflow to this lagoon is controlled by a couple of pipes because if you buy fancy waterfront property, you don't ever want it to be low tide. Uh, and through a purse comm from the person who controls the pipes, they're pretty much always closed in the winter, uh, which is when green crab larvae are in the water column. And so what we believe is that green crabs got in here initially, and now because of this weird artificial situation, they can't get out. So there's not, this particular site is disconnected from the larger uh, dispersal up and down the coast. Um, and I should say that this is very consistent. I found weird physiological results for this population. And some of my collaborators did a really extensive ecological survey and found that demographically, this one site is pretty much disconnected from all of the other sites that are really near it. There are green crabs, I should say, there's a healthy population here in this lagoon uh, that's well connected to the global, to the general circulation, but this is sea drift, which is not. So. What I kind of want you to take away from that is that, generally speaking, dispersal is very high up and down the coast, 
and that when it's restricted, we can see that signal. It builds up very, very quickly. So it isn't a question of these sites just not having time to diverge. So that's sea drift. It's like Las Vegas. What happens there stays there. And so we're going to leave it out of the rest of this analysis and ask about the thing I'm really interested in is what about selection? Is there any indication of selection? So we did a couple of uh, different association tests and looked at the relationship with um, those SNPs and uh, latitude and summer sea surface temperature. So I didn't look at winter sea surface temperature because it's very, very closely correlated with latitude. So I'm going to show you some results with latitude that stands in for cold temperatures as well. Uh, so I ran this through a couple of uh, approaches, uh, kind of looked at overlap, as you often do, uh, looked for markers that seem to have robust patterns, and ended up with two initial candidate regions showing pretty nice uh, patterns with latitude or with sea surface temperature. Now, I only have five sites, but I do have temporal data, and the temporal data should support these patterns if they're true. And in one case they do, and in one case they don't. So I think uh, for other reasons as well, that association with July sea surface temperature, I think is just kind of spurious thing you're gonna get if you look at thousands of loci and you only have five sites. So let's look more at that other uh, candidate region. Well, what's in that region? It isn't just one SNP, it isn't just one transcript. It is a represents a ton of SNPs and strong linkage disequilibrium when I go back to those pruned, those data that I pruned out of the data set. And I wanted to look at this more uh, systematically. So while, again, I don't have a genome, so a lot of the uh, kind of cool approaches for looking directly at regions of reduced recombination are not open to me, there is an R program called LDNA that uses pairwise uh, linkage disequilibrium between SNPs to infer kind of clusters of SNPs that are in uh, reduced recombination, that are in reduced recombination regions, essentially. Uh, unfortunately, the outer output from this program is not super user friendly, but suffice it to say that essentially we just identified one group of markers in this whole SNP set over 9,000 that appeared to be in um, reduced recombination, so kind of inherited together. And that one region, which had 168 SNPs in it, in I believe over 30 different transcripts, is the one region that I have in uh, showing strong association with temperature. Uh, and I think it's likely an inversion polymorphism, although again, I can't tell for sure uh, without having a genome. Uh, and that's just a part of a chromosome that basically flips 180 degrees. And so now you're maintaining two uh, structural variant alleles in your population. So you can have normal recombination outside of that region, normal recombination in homozygotes, and reduced restricted um, recombination in heterozygotes. And so it sort of lets the inverted and the non-inverted region kind of wander off on their own evolutionary trajectories. Um, and they're kind of fascinating because there is a lot of work suggesting that that can help multiple uh, alleles, multiple adaptive alleles kind of build up in one or the other of these, um, these inversion alleles. And uh, there's a lot of theoretical work on inversions and how they arise and when they arise. Uh, this is uh, some work by Sam Yeaman uh, showing if you kind of start with a chromosome and you put some adaptive uh, alleles along this chromosome evenly, and then you let it evolve in, um, in time, uh, either in a homogeneous or heterogeneous environment, and you allow this chromosome to rearrange. Essentially, you allow inversions, you allow other structural variants. Uh, in a homogeneous environment, you pretty much maintain your variation kind of evenly across the genome where you started it or across the chromosome. In a heterogeneous environment, it starts to cluster more and more and more uh, in different regions like inversions. Uh, and there's some other work to support the idea that essentially if you have a lot of variation in time or in space in your selective environment, you can often get uh, adaptation sort of uh, concentrated in regions of um, reduced recombination or inversions. And I think that's very likely what I have. If I take these 168 SNPs and I pop them on a PCA, I get this. So along the princ first principal component, three distinct groups. And that's very likely to correspond to essentially homozygotes on either side for the inversion or the, uh, without the inversion and heterozygotes in the middle. Um, and inbreeding coefficients support this. Uh, essentially, you look at the putative homozygotes on either side. Uh, they're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and you have a huge um, 
heterozygote excess in that middle group, which you believe would correspond to um, a, the heterozygotes for the inverted and non-inverted alleles. Um, this is all a lot of uh, a kind of, not speculation, but a lot of uh, inference because again, we don't have a genome. If I had a genome, oh, it would be amazing, but uh, we do not. But I thought this was really fascinating because we find chromosomal inversions when we look for them or even when we don't more and more in adaptive studies, especially when you have a lot of gene flow among groups. So they're associated with a lot of different stable differences in phenotype and ecotype. So for example, in an interbreeding population of codfish in the North Sea, uh, it is uh, an inversion polymorphism that determines whether a cod is migratory or stationary. And they're also found more and more frequently, again, when we start to look across environmental gradients. Uh, so salinity, altitude, temperature, uh, and latitude. And one of the classic examples is actually from invasion from Drosophila subobscura, which has a nice uh, inversion cline, several inversion clines really in the native range in Europe with latitude. And those were recapitulated quite quickly in the invasive ranges in North and South America. And just to show you when I take those markers, those 168 markers in this putative inversion out of the data set, uh, even without any other LD pruning, that selective signal basically com completely disappears. Uh, and we just see that population genetic signal of restricted dispersal. So that was pretty exciting. It's neat to find this uh, likely inversion strongly associated with latitude uh, in under 30 years in this bottlenecked population. But I was mostly excited to see it because I've seen it before in an independent study using global populations in association with cold tolerance. So this is my PhD work. And now I'm showing you the same potential inversion and the minor allele frequency associated with or um, correlated with uh, physiological cold tolerance. And that is measured as the heart rate at zero degrees. So just on that x-axis there, a larger number is better, a higher heart rate at zero gives you more aerobic scope and more ability to avoid predation, predate other things, and just do like beneficial crab stuff. So you can see that the northern populations in Norway and Newfoundland are kind of on the right hand side of that scale versus Portugal on the left hand side. Uh, so like I said, I was really fascinated to find this same, these, these, in, these studies were these, these searches essentially for um, adaptive loci were conducted independently. Uh, but again, in this global data set, that was the largest uh, region of reduced recombination I found by far across all my SNPs in one of the strongest signals of selection. Uh, and I wanna show you the global study in part because it provides a much stronger linked temperature and thermal physiology, whereas latitude and cold temperatures are just almost perfectly correlated on the West Coast. That is not the case on the global data set. They're not particularly well linked. And the other thing that I find really useful about that is that uh, what it told me was that this inversion evolved in the native range and it came over in the first introduction of standing genetic variation and then it also made it over to the west coast as standing genetic variation. So what's it doing functionally? Well, first, because I'm using uh, transcriptome derived SNPs, I'm able to predict what those SNPs might be doing in their various genes. Uh, and so just as a first pass, and look through and bin them into untranslated SNPs in the untranslated region of the mRNA and coding SNPs, which are either synonymous or non-synonymous. And the SNPs in this putative uh, inversion are enriched for coding SNPs and weakly enriched for non-synonymous SNPs relative to the full SNP set, which is some suggestion there might be something interesting functionally going on in this region. I do have a dreaded gene list, but I want to focus your attention. Uh, and, and again, it's a non-model organism, so a decent amount of transcripts are either not annotated or kind of not well annotated, where it's sort of hand wavy and it's a putative Daphnia protein. Uh, I hate those. <laughs> They're so frustrating. Um, but I want to draw your attention to one in particular, one gene in particular, and that's hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha. It has um, uh, two amino acid changing uh, polymorphisms between the inversion and the non-inversion. And I'm really interested in this. Uh, if you're wondering uh, why I'm interested to find a hypoxia gene in my thermal data set, this is a master regulator of um, uh, hypoxia response. 
And that's because in crustaceans, and there's some direct evidence in green crabs, that thermal tolerance limits are probably set by uh, cellular oxygen, essentially. Um, basically through slightly different mechanisms when you get to hot and cold extremes, cellular demand for oxygen outstrips supply, and that the going theory is that that sets the thermal limits ultimately. And so this is a figure from a physiology paper by Hans Otto Portner, who came up with this theory and has done a lot of research on it. And you can see HIF1, my, my little gene there, uh, helping to increase aerobic capacity and oxygen supply pathways uh, and implicated potentially in shifting some of these thermal limits in, um, in crustaceans. So I can't say for sure that this is functionally doing anything, but I think it's a really interesting candidate. And something we're doing in my lab is looking a lot more at the structure and function of what's going on with this inferred inversion. So partly we're doing some targeted long read sequencing to try to characterize uh, more, maybe all of this region uh, to get a better idea of all the genes that might be in it. Um, because the transcriptome sequencing is only showing me some of the genes, the ones that are transcribed at a high enough level in all my populations. And then a new uh, NSF postdoc, Yama Ibn Katerman, is very interested in linking inversion genotype to phenotype at an individual level and how that interplays with the animal's plasticity. She also has a really strong background in epigenetics, so she's going to, I think, bring some of that to bear. So it's very excited to see these stuff. Uh, so, all right, I've got this, uh, this nice client on the West Coast, but I've actually done a lot more sequencing on the West Coast since this paper, largely for uh, looking at population structure and dispersal, working with um, managers and policymakers on spread. So let's see how it holds up. Uh, and I wanna point out too um, that green crab distribution is a bit weird on the West Coast. It's actually quite patchy. They don't seem to be able to invade the rocky intertidal. And so it's really just protected embayments where we see green crabs. So if it looks patchy where I've sampled after this, I've actually sampled almost all the major green crab populations. It's just the distribution's not totally continuous. So here's our original five sites. Here's the temporal data just to show you those again. And let's fill in the picture a little bit more. So this pattern holds up pretty well across a really broad range of sites. So I'm very interested in looking more at that. Uh, and I, I do have data from Haida Gwaii and Alaska, where I have samples from there, but I don't have those data processed and ready to add. So I'm really curious what that looks like. Those are those very northernmost sites that were just recently uh, established and discovered. And this is more ongoing research we have in the lab. So we've put together a targeted genotyping panel so we can go back to um, basically do cheap, high throughput inversion genotyping and population genetic genotyping of a ton of samples. I want to look at historical change since introduction. There are historical samples going back to uh, 1993, just four years after the first discovery that we'd like to revisit with this. I want to look at responsiveness to interannual temperature variation. So if this is a balanced polymorphism, as I believe it is an inversion, it should respond every year to temperatures in that year. And in some cases, I have newly settled uh, crabs from the same site for four and five years in a row from multiple sites. So I'm very curious to see if um, this inversion changes with interannual variation in temperature. And there has been some of that, uh, some really interesting temperature anomalies um, in the West Coast since the time I've started this. Uh, and finally, I'm doing a lot looking at the dynamics and the currently expanding range edges, both way up to the north and into the Salish Sea, which is still actively uh, happening. And this is not actually quite the end of the talk. I want to say the acknowledgments for the green crab stuff, and then I want to talk a little bit, um, go back a little bit. Uh, this is a highly collaborative project. I've been really lucky to work with a huge network of ecologists, researchers, um, managers, and policymakers along the West Coast who have provided me with samples, including from the very first crabs that are found in some of these new areas, which has been really fantastic. Uh, and uh, so I owe a huge debt of gratitude to that whole network. Uh, most of the key players are listed up here. Uh, they make it much more interesting to do this work because they have this really rich context of, um, of dynamics and populations that they're working on uh, and also make it a lot more fun. I want to particularly mention Emily Grayson and Sean McDonald at Washington Sea Grant's CRAB team who run this incredible citizen science network that is out in the Salish Sea every year for the past five years, every two months, looking for green crabs in new sites. So they're really uh, capturing that expanding range edge amazingly. And then they're taking those crabs and giving them to me, which is really exciting. <laughs>
uh, and also the major funders I want to thank, which is National Science Foundation, particularly in the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. But I have a little bit more. I've also went, gone through this much faster than I intended, so I apologize. Um, but my kind of final thoughts and the things I really want to talk to people about here today is this idea that maybe high dispersal, I say marine species, maybe this applies more broadly, I'm interested in what folks think about that, may evolve uh, standing genetic variation that primes them for invasive success, essentially. So, you know, high dispersal, which they have, many of these have in their native range, promotes uh, balanced polymorphisms that are maintained across this larger metapopulation. And it especially does that at alleles of large effect, like chromosomal inversions, right? Um, and so the, the reason that this variation evolves that way is to promote uh, success and maintenance across, when you disperse across a wide environmental gradient in your native range. But I think that may also be really advantageous when you come into a new environment. It doesn't have to be novel necessarily, but if you're spreading across a gradient in a new environment, as long as that standing variation is present, uh, it suggests that you may be ready to go. Is it hot? Is it cold? You know, everybody settles and let selection decide. Uh, and so to me, that suggests that it may really not require, at least in species like this, a lot of overall broadband genetic diversity. You might just need variation at a couple key adaptive loci to really get you going initially in, how, in, uh, in spreading across new environmental gradients. Um, and so I wanna just sum all of those ideas up, or I, I am not gonna sum all those ideas up. I'm gonna leave it to, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a noted uh, expert in alien species, Han Solo. So <laughs> that's, that's my, a lot of the stuff I've been thinking about and I'd love to talk to folks more about that. Um, maybe. Great, thanks for another great talk. Any questions for Carolyn? Um, I was just wondering what uh, what happened to the frequency of the inversion in um, that uh, lagoon population? Oh, yeah, so uh, let's see. I have a million things I took out, let's see. Ah, so interestingly, it doesn't hold up. Uh, so the Sea Drift Lagoon, I, I took this out for time, I probably should have kept it in, um, is in the pink triangle there. And there's another site, uh, Sook Basin up north that I found that also has severely restricted dispersal and its own distinct genetic signature and a huge genetic bottleneck uh, for different reasons, but other reasons that make sense oceanographically. That also doesn't hold up. That's the blue triangle. And what I strongly suspect is happening, I actually think it's more interesting that I'm not seeing that happen in, in areas where dispersal is limited. And I think that there could be two or probably more things going on. One is just that uh, the selective environment temperature may not be as critical in those uh, really restricted dispersal environments. There may be some other dynamic that's important. What I really think is more likely is that uh, the temperature data, you know, latitude and sea surface temperature data from satellite data are well correlated, but these crabs are never getting out into the broader circulation where the satellite data applies. They're staying in these really restricted embayments, which may have very different thermal regimes that we're not capturing and that don't reflect latitude very well. Uh, so for example, and we're trying to get winter sea surface temperature data from loggers from these places, but we're having terrible luck with our loggers like failing and being lost. Uh, but one of the thoughts is sea drift lagoon is very, very shallow. And so it may get warmer and particularly colder in the winter than a lot of the surrounding environment. And it's showing a more, a cold adapted signature essentially. Sea drift lagoon is very deep and very protected and it may be warmer. Uh, than its uh, neighboring places. And so that's something we're really interested in looking at. But I do find it really interesting that everywhere we look where dispersal is high, this pattern holds up. And the only exceptions are the sites where dispersal is really restricted. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah. I was just interested in how they, um, were dispersed between the east and the west coast. Were they like oh, deliberately moved there? They were not 
We think that they traveled by air, actually. Really? Yeah. So uh, it was not deliberate. No one would deliberately introduce a green graph. No, I, I wouldn't think. have thought. But I was um, wondering how they got across the. They couldn't have walked. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It doesn't make sense because there are green crab populations in Australia and in Japan. So you know, initially before the genetics, the thought was that's probably where they came from because uh, San Francisco Bay is a huge uh, port connection. But um, there is a a couple big industries in in New England, particularly in Maine, in live uh, marine animals, so lobsters for seafood and uh, bloodworms or baitworms, which are these polychaetes that are sold for bait. They're sold all around the country, and they're packed in what's called wormweed. It's Ascophyllum seaweed, and so uh, some friends of mine, um, Amy Fowler and April Blakesley, particularly, did a really interesting study on the worm shipments around the US and have found that tons of little animals, as you might expect, uh, are riding along in this weed. And, you know, the whole point of the weed is to keep these other animals alive. So all the little stuff stays alive pretty well, too. Uh, so we think that it probably traveled that way. Maybe some maybe some restaurant in San Francisco bought a bunch of lobster and thought, oh, what are we going to do with the seaweed? That's ah, smelly. We won't put it in the trash. Let's just put it in the bay. Uh, so we're not positive, you know, it's so hard, right, to be positive if you don't have a, a deliberate introduction, but that's how we think they got there. So yeah, by air, not what you would expect for a crab. <laughs> yeah, that was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, uh, the question about the inversions, because you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, Sam Eamon's paper, mm -hmm. and what I, what I thought was interesting about that paper was the idea that not just that recombination suppressed in that inversion, but it can actually bring yeah. adaptive alleles together uh, so that the, the alleles of interest may actually be outside the inversion, but at that interface. And I'm wondering if you can comment on whether it's genes in the inversion versus at the points of the inversion itself in that overlap. Yeah, I, well, there's a lot of really interesting theory on how inversions evolve. And so, you know, one of the thoughts is that you Maybe you have, um, you know, one adaptive allele, and then you get an inversion, and maybe that inversion is maintained because you get another adaptation in it, and another, and another. And then I think Sam's paper, the point is that if you allow chromosomal um, rearrangement, that you know you can have these patterns that arise where, you know, presumably randomly, you have a break that brings two things together, essentially, um, you know, two adaptive alleles closer together, and then that rearrangement is kind of uh, preferred, and then that that can kind of keep, keep going, essentially. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really, it's something I've been doing more reading into. I think it's really interesting, but I think that's quite, I thought that paper was really neat in the idea that it doesn't have to be that these, in, these adaptive diversity that's involved in this doesn't have to arise in that rearrangement. It can possibly be brought there. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's quite. I, I'm not sure if that's that's what you were hoping to to hear, but or well, what, just, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I was just wondering, if, like, when you're looking at your yeah. um, gene expression data, is mm -hmm. that all in in the inversion, or do you know what's happening at the at the inversion? I points? don't. I don't know where the edges are, and that's one of the reasons we're doing the long read sequencing. Is I want to figure that out. Um, I mean, inversions are also like there's a lot of there's, there's certainly some examples of adaptive roles for inversions or other changes in chromosomal architecture when you break a gene, right, or, or a transcription factor or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, the, the variation that I see is scattered across a lot of different genes, but I don't, and some of them I know from the long read work we've done already are at least proximate to each other, but I don't have a good sense. And that is something I wish we had a good chromosome scale genome because I would love to know what this region looks like. I'd like to be able to prove it's an inversion. You know, right now I can't, but it doesn't seem to be likely to be anything else. So yeah, that's that's all stuff we're hoping to do. If you have someone, if you have some pull with our National Science Foundation and know someone who would like to put a whole lot of money into a green crab, you know, that would be fantastic. 